Who are the greatest drummers of all time? What criteria do we use to decide who are the greatest? I mean, we know who we hear about the most, but are they really the greatest? I am really excited about this because to know our instrument better, to know music better, we have to know the history of it. Not only the instrument, but the history of the players as well. And there's no better place to start than the history of jazz drumming. Why? because the drum set literally came about through the art form of jazz. So let's look at the 20 greatest jazz drummers. Now, I want to clarify, you all know, I don't like pitting one drummer against another. I think that's an impossible thing to do. You really oh, no. can't uh, compare art like you can a baseball card. You really have to look at it as art. So I don't wanna do that. But what I wanna do is use the criteria of who had the most influence? Who were the innovators? Who helped create the modern drum kit? Who helped create the modern sound that we have? So that's the lens we're looking through. We're not looking through who were just the fastest, who were the most impressive. That really has nothing to do with this. This is who were the greatest drummers and others? Who made the biggest contribution to this art form? Jazz is something near and dear to my heart. It's actually what I have my degree in, even though I don't get to play it much these days. I've got a degree in jazz studies for whatever that paper's worth. And so uh, many of these players, I spent a long, long time studying both their playing as well as the history of them on the instrument. I'm well aware that some of you may disagree with me and that's totally fine. Greatest lists are totally subjective. So put your favorites down in the comments. These are my 20 picks for the greatest jazz drummers that had the greatest influence on this art form and on this instrument. Instead of listing these in order of like the most innovative, I'm going to be listing them more chronologically. This isn't perfect chronological order. Some of these overlap, some came just slightly before, slightly after, but I'm doing my best to give you a timeline of what happened within the innovation of drumming, the drum set, and the art form of jazz. We'll start in no other place than New Orleans, Louisiana, the birthplace of jazz, with none other than the man who played with Louis Armstrong. He played with Jelly Roll Morton, and he as, is known to be one of the best pre-big band drummers that there was. His name is Baby Dodds. Many of you may not have heard of him. Now, the deal with Baby Dodds is he was one of the first recorded drummers that was ever recorded improvising. I know that sounds like not a big deal to us, but back then, you didn't really improvise within the music. Now, the contribution that he made that's so important was is related to what they would call his shimmy beat. Now, at the time, Time, drummers were playing a type of a buzz roll on two and four. So it'd be a bat, zzz, bat, zzz, except it was a very short buzz roll. And what he did was a very simple thing. He extended that buzz roll to where it almost overlapped with the one and the three. So bat, zzz, 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 zzz. We call the shimmy beat. Yeah. Oh, now what they call it? Uh, yeah. No, but this, I, I, I'm the only one doing it. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. That's hard work. Now, what this led to later was what we now know as the common jazz ride cymbal pattern. Ching, ching, ding. That thing came from Baby Dodds. This was in the early days of the drum set, so there weren't a lot of cymbals around. Sometimes there would be one attached to the bass drum. And Baby Dodds is actually re somewhat responsible for the first sock cymbal or hi-hat cymbal. They used to be very, very low to the ground. They were called sock cymbals. So the story goes that William Ludwig came to see Baby Dodds playing on a steamboat. I believe it was in St. Louis. And you notice that Dodds was bouncing his foot. So he asked him, he said, hey, can you do that with your toe instead of your heel? And Dodd said, well, I think so. So Ludwig went away, came back later with the first prototype of what would be the sock symbol. He gave it to Dodds. Turns out Dodds hated the sock symbol, but he had just taken the symbol off of his bass drum because he couldn't stand the tinny sound. So he in general didn't like using those symbols. He felt it interrupted the flow of his beats, his shimmy beats, and his buzz rolls. You may also hear the term press roll. That really means the same thing as a buzz roll. Press roll, buzz roll, or interchangeable. The album to check him out on uh, are one that I like, uh, I like is Baby Dodd's a Jazz a la Creole. The second drummer in our lineup is Chick Webb. Now 
Now, Chick Webb suffered from something uh, called tuberculosis of the spine. Uh, he, he suffered a fall down some stairs when he was a child, and this made him somewhat short as well as hunchbacked when he got older. He was one of the best known drummers uh, during the and band leaders of the new swing era. Uh, he directly influenced both G uh, Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich actually said he's the daddy of them all. He also introduced a young Ella Fitzgerald uh, in her teens to the world through his band. He was a huge influence to many later jazz drummers. Uh, both Art Blakey and Duke Ellington uh, were quoted as saying that he was a massive influence both in their band leading, uh, their composing, their you know their sound. Uh, now, the thing you need to know about Chick Webb and Baby Dodds and drummers of that time is they don't always translate so great on recording because the recording techniques and, and instruments they had uh, at the time were not really great for picking up the dynamic range that the drums were producing. Producing. A good album to check him out on is Ella Sings, Chick Swings. Now, some will consider this next one the world's greatest drummer. You'll hear that term multiple times throughout this, uh, players referring to other players, what the general population thinks, and it just goes to show you there's no consensus here. There's no world's greatest drummer. So the next in the lineup is Gene Krupa. Now, Gene Krupa's contribution to the drumming, uh, to drumming, the drum set, the art form is immeasurable, uh, not only in his playing, but also the revolutions that he helped uh, uh, and improvements he helped to bring about on the drum set. He was really the first rock star drummer, even though he was a jazz big band drummer. Now, he wasn't just influential in his playing, he was also influential in, in how he he helped bring the drum set along. Uh, he collaborated directly as Sling Owen's first endorsed artist to make the first tunable Tom Tom. In addition to that, he was collaborating directly with Armand Zildjian. The cymbals at the time were very, very thick. They were orchestral cymbals, and they really didn't translate well for the drumming that was going on in that style. So he really helped bring about and standardize that thinner cymbal that we know today. As well, he was the first drummer, uh, if I'm getting this correct, to request a 16-inch crash cymbal on his left side. Uh, up to that time, uh, ride cymbals were like 14 inches and hi-hats were 12 inches and, and 10 inches and, and uh, lower. So he was the first one to request that crash cymbal. He helped standardize many of the standard names for the cymbals like the splash, the crash, the swish, the ride. So he not only was a huge contribution in the drumming department, he was also a huge contribution in just the, the modern drum set and how it looks. Around 1978, uh, Gene Krupa was the first drummer inducted into the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame and he's just continued to influence drummers uh, throughout the years. An album to check him out on is Krupa Rocks. Uh, and then a song obviously that everyone knows by Gene Krupa it would be the famous Sing Sing Sing. This next drummer practically invented the modern jazz uh, style with his smooth swinging ride beat. Uh, he played in the original, or he played, was a member of the Count Basie uh, All-American Rhythm Section, and uh, it was just a huge influential figure in the drumming and in jazz. Uh, Joe Jones, he later became known as Papa Joe Jones, he's the fourth drummer here. Uh, he moved the timekeeping from the bass drum to the hi-hat. Up until that time, they were walking the bass drum on quarter notes, and then he moved that to the hi-hat, which influenced all swing and bop drummers from that time forward. He also worked directly with Avitas to define the, si the sound of the hi-hat cymbal, and then he really uh, did a lot to usher in uh, the use of brushes within the jazz form, and uh, he is still considered to be one of the world's best uh, brush players that's ever lived. In his later years, he lived up to his name, Papa Joe Jones. He was very much a mentor to, to many up and coming players. And a great album to check him out on is Joe Jones, The Main Man. Fifth up on the list is none other than the man himself. We all know him, Buddy Rich. Those are my brand new Ludwig brand drums. Brand new First Ludwig drums. Played them. Mr. Buddy Rich.
widely hailed. Again, we heard this with Gene Krupa, but as the world's greatest drummer, uh, many people know him. He was another rock star type drummer. He was known for his power, for his technique, for his finesse. Uh, he was also known for his intense work ethic, which sometimes came off as uh, somewhat short or rude, as many of us uh, who have heard recordings of that know. Uh, he ran a big band. He also played for a ton of other artists, but he was very well known for running his own big band. He was born into a vaudevillian family. I believe his mother and father were both in the vaudeville. Uh, so he was on a stage from around the age of two on. He was performing in front of people. And his influence to drumming, he's, he's inspired so many people to pick up the drums as well as inspired the sound of so many drummers. He was also the first American drummer that many British rock drummers heard. And so he inspired players like John Bonham and Bill Ward to begin uh, straying away from the typical two and four backbeats and put in there some hard hitting improvisational patterns. And then a great album to listen to uh, for him with some classic buddy uh, stuff is Big Swing Face. <laughs> This next one, some of you may not know, number six is Kenny Clark. Now, his style really laid the groundwork for all modern jazz drumming. So he was nicknamed Kluke because, one of, because of one of his signature drum licks. And he was really responsible for moving the timekeeping. Remember, Philly Joe Jones moved it from the bass drum to the hi-hat. So you would have heard Baby Dodds keeping time with that bass drum. Then we have Philly Joe Jones keeping time with that hi-hat on two and four. Now we have Kenny Clark coming along and bringing that time to the ride cymbal. He was present at the inception of bebop and was also one of its major innovators. Uh, another thing that he did was um, he would incorporate these hard-hitting uh, bass drum syncopations within that jazz ride cymbal pattern, which we all do nowadays. Uh, and at the times they called them bombs or dropping bombs. His influence was huge on players like Art Blakey, as well as others like Max Roach. Uh, a great album to listen to for him is Bohemia After Dark. Uh, it features some of the earliest recordings of uh, Cannonball Adderley as well as Nat Adderley. Number seven is one of my personal favorites. His hands are incredible. You just gotta check that, check out the guy's hands and what he does with the sticks. Number seven is Joe Morello. Now, get this, Joe Morello did the unthinkable. He made a chart-topping song with the Dave Brubeck group. And uh, here's the thing, it had no vocals, right? It was a jazz tune, so no vocals, jazz tune. Uh, it was also in an odd time signature and it featured a drum solo. That's right, it's take five. He was the drummer on that cut. He was very well known for his melodic soloing, as you can hear on the song, take five. Uh, he was also uh, over on over 120 uh, recordings. He was a gifted educator as well, uh, publishing several books, as well as publishing in the uh, video format. As I've already mentioned, he was a master of drum technique. He was voted Playboy Magazine's Drummer of the Year seven times in a row. He won Downbeat Magazine's the same, Best Drummer of the Year five years in a row, and then he was inducted both into the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame as well as the Percussive Art Society's Hall of Fame. A great album to listen to him on is the Dave Brubeck Quartet, uh, Time Out, and that actually features the song that I've just been talking about, Take Five. Number eight, a lot of you know him, 
Max Roach. Now, it's been said that what John Bonham did for hard rock, Max Roach did to jazz. He was one of the founders of modern jazz, who was a huge innovator uh, within bebop. Now, we, we've already heard Kenny Clark was one of the, uh, was, was really the one that kind of brought about the bebop style of drumming, but Max Roach really took it to that next level. Max viewed himself not only as just the timekeeper, which was kind of the modern view of uh, drummers at that time, he, he viewed himself as an equal part of the band. And and so he was very well known for having these engaging and responsive conversations with the other players through his playing. Uh, he, he had this rock solid pulse and was just a huge mover in the bebop style. Uh, he was well known and respected as a band leader and one of the first jazz musicians to teach uh, full time at the college level. Some good albums to listen to would be Clifford Brown and Max Roach's album uh, Study in Brown as well as Max Roach's uh, album Drums Unlimited, which uh, I believe uh, features the great track, uh, the drum also waltzes, I believe that's, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. Number nine is Philly Joe Jones, not to be confused with Papa Joe Jones. Uh, Philly Joe Jones came around a little bit later, uh, was a member of the first great uh, quintet, Miles Davis's first great quintet. And uh, it's been said that what uh, Papa Joe Jones did for the rhythm section in the 30s and 40s, Philly Joe Jones did that for the rhythm section in the 50s, right? So that 50s to 60s time, he was very, very influential. Now, for some reason around 1962, some people think that it's because Elvin Jones came on the scene and took some of that limelight. Uh, he really kind of fell off the radar after 1962. 62, was still playing, still teaching, but just never on the uh, the public level that he was before. He later moved to England and made his mark teaching there, really improving the, ta the pool of talent that they had uh, in that area. Fantastic album to listen to. Uh, Philly's playing on is Miles Davis's album, Milestones. <laughs> Number 10, one of my favorites, you'll hear me say that a lot, is Art Blakey. Now, Art Blakey, uh, when he was young, came under the tutelage of Chick Webb. He actually was uh, his valet. He took up Chick's hard swinging style and was one of the inventors of the modern bebop style of drumming. Now, you've already heard me refer to Kenny Clark as well as Max Roach within that bebop style. You have Art Blakey coming up in that tradition as well. Uh, he ran his band, the Jazz Messengers, for 35 years and his incessant uh, two and four on the hi-hat uh, as well as hard swinging uh, ride pattern were present throughout that group. Now that group was actually an incubator for many, many side men. Uh, and that's one of the things that he's very, very well known for, not just being a great player, uh, but also being this mentor to so many people and bringing them into his group and allowing them to grow through the music and over time explore and, and really develop their sound. I've got these achievements written down. Blakey was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame, the Downbeat Jazz Hall of Fame, the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame, and received a Grammy. Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. And really his legacy is, is not only his music uh, and him as a band leader and him as a drummer, but also him as a mentor and a person to the musicians that played with him. Now, one of my favorite albums is uh, the Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, uh, Moaning, Monin, uh, M-O-A-N-I-N. Uh, and this really has, to me, one of the perfect examples of a jazz shuffle on it. Uh, Blakey just kills it and his press rolls are pfft, the crazy good. Number 11 is the infamous Roy Haynes. He's really the epitome of cool. Uh, he was one of the most recorded jazz drummers in history. Haynes had a style that was characterized with uh, Christmas. 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 
with finesse and really just an overall, there's no better way to explain it, cool. He just kind of exuded cool. Uh, he uh, had an incredible drive to his playing, and some uh, came to term that or call that hard bop, which later developed into its own kind of subgenre of its own. Haynes helped to pave the way for other dr well-known drummers like Elvin Jones and Tony Williams. Uh, as well, he worked with, I've got, let's see, we worked with Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, Charlie Parker, Stan Getz, Sarah Vaughn, John Coltrane, Chick Corea, Pat Metheny, and a slew of others. A great album to listen to him on, that one of my, one of my favorite Chick albums is Chick Corea's now he sings, uh, excuse me, now he sings, now he sobs. Number 12, he's a player that played with Miles Davis, Coltrane, Cannonball Adderley, et cetera, and so forth. Jimmy Cobb. Now, he played on what is, many say, is the most popular jazz recording of all time, although I'm not sure that we can really measure that, depending on what scale we're measuring that on. Uh, and that is Jimmy Cobb. And he uh, played on the album Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. Also of note, he played on Sketches of Spain. Uh, the opening track for that is one of my personal faves. Uh, but his playing is incredible. He had this insane, just uh, driving quarter note ride cymbal pattern, as well as he was very well known for being able to drive a band with nothing but brushes. Also inducted into the uh, PAS Hall of Fame, some of his influences that he listed were Kenny Clark, who we heard about earlier, uh, the, one of the innovators of bebop, as well as Shadow Wilson. He was a drummer for Count Basie. We got Big Sid Cadlick and then uh, Catlett and then Max Roach, also one of the innovators of bebop. Those were some of his influences that he listed. A great album, obviously, to listen to. I've already listed two, but I'll list it again. Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. That was really where I discovered Jimmy's playing. Number 13 may be debatable by some of you. Maybe some controversy there. This drummer was stated by Tony Williams as being one of the best drummers in the world. He said there was no argument. It wasn't based upon opinion. It was just a fact. And that man is... Alan Dawson. Now, many of you may not know Alan Dawson as a player, who he was an insane player. And I've got listed here. He played with, I mean, it's a list of who's who. His recording credits, Lionel Hampton, the Dave Brubeck Quartet, Bill Evans, Charles Mingus, Sonny Rollins. Uh, just an insane lineup. But some of his former students would be John Jr. Robinson, Terry Lynn Carrington, uh, Benny Caliuda. Tony Williams himself, at a young age, I believe around nine, began taking Alan, taking from Alan. Alan used to go pick Tony up, he'd drive, uh, you know, 90, 60, 90 miles one way, pick him up, take him to the gig with him, let him kind of kind of see what was going on, then drive him home and get him home safely. This is the kind of influence that this guy had. The reason he's in this list is he didn't just influence the music, he influenced the players. Now, he began teaching at Berkeley College of Music around 1957, really never intended on being a teacher. But uh, he found that his playing improved and his teaching improved the longer he did it. So his teaching style really focused on teaching drumming through teaching music. So he really taught players how to play music. He uh, was big about singing the melody while you were playing and learning the form of the tune. He believed that this would give you greater capacity uh, to support the players as well as the song. And the list of drummers that have come through under his tutelage, you can say, yeah, you were probably right. Uh, he also took very standard drumming texts like syncopation, Ted Reed's syncopation, and came up with a way to work through many exercises to develop vocabulary within the jazz genre. He actually took 
everything that was going on in jazz and came up with a systemized way for us to learn it. That's a huge deal. Many of us have gone through that, myself included. I actually have taken from two former Alan Dawson students, uh, both Jeff Mills and Henrique the Almeida. For me, if Tony Williams says it, it must be true. I really do think Alan Dawson was one of the greatest drummers in the world. A great album to listen to him on live was the Dave Brubeck Quartet, The Last Set at Newport. Now we're warming up. We're coming to number 14. This guy, huge influence on me, huge influence on so many players. The next couple ones were huge influences on me. Uh, we have number 14, none other than Mr. Elvin Jones. This guy was one of the most significant drummers of the post-bop era. Remember, we had that bebop era. Uh, we're getting into the post-bop era, right? Uh, and he was also a member of the notorious John Coltrane uh, classic quartet that's got McCoy Tyner on piano and then none other than Jimmy Garrison on bass. He's very well known for his insane rhythmic independence, uh, he, his uh, phrasing and tone and color, and then also his continuous stream of evolving accents and patterns around the drum kit. Uh, he was also a very well-known soloist, uh, really uh, stayed close to the melody uh, and used that song form almost, you know, what we were talking about with that, what Alan Dawson was teaching, uh, really used the song form to drive his soloing. If we understand the melody, then we can understand how the melody or that rhythmic phrase can be developed. The melody being uh, in terms of... of uh, rhythm I'll play it again and I'll add say the bass drum this time I'll add the tom times I'll add the end and from there I'll go into another whole course His style of drumming at the time was completely left of center to what other drummers were doing. He was thinking in a very thematic way with tones and colors. He viewed the drum set as one instrument and not separate, not drum, 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 cymbal, cymbal. It was all one instrument. Uh, he viewed himself as a very valid part of the group that informed what was going on. Uh, he was so unorthodox that many players early on had trouble playing with him. Uh, they didn't understand his style, but he really did believe in what he was doing. He believed he was doing it for the music. In other words, the music was driving his decisions, so he really stuck with what he believed in and in the end revolutionized jazz. His comping patterns involved intricate tom and snare patterns, giving it this roaring uh, triplet-based uh, feel, uh, this roaring rolling feel. He played on the uh, infamous uh, John Coltrane recording, A Love Supreme. And if you want to listen to an album that's a great Elvin cut, that would be one, A Love Supreme. Number 15, also somebody that I studied a ton, uh, that's Tony Williams. He was a member of the Miles Davis's, uh, or of Miles Davis's second great quintet when he was just a teenager. That's how good he was. Now, you remember Alan Dawson. We gotta, we gotta put all the parts together. You remember Alan Dawson, right? He was teaching all these great players. Tony was one of them. When he was nine, he started taking from Alan. Now you have Tony coming up as a teenager, having taken from Alan. That's why he's one of the greatest drummers in the world. Having taken from Alan, revolutionizing the scene, right? He was a member of that uh, uh, quintet, and the other members of that were um, Herbie Hancock, 
on piano, Ron Carter on bass, and later completed by uh, Wayne Shorter on the saxophone. He broke the standard mold of the time, moving the hi-hat not just on two and four, but put it on quarter notes, uh, this driving quarter note hi-hat beat with his foot. Oftentimes in other places, that wasn't the only thing he did, but that really broke the mold of the time. And then he had this pulse-oriented ride cymbal beat that really paved the way for the more um, eighth note oriented, 16th note oriented patterns that were gonna come around with fusion. He went on to preempt jazz rock fusion and is widely considered the link between jazz and rock that allowed uh, fusion to go mainstream. Hands down, one of my favorite albums of all time that he's on is Miles Davis's Nefertiti. That cut on that album in particular is just amazing. Number 16, one of the greatest players in the jazz genre, a career that spans five decades, uh, it's Jack DeJanette. He was known as both a sideman as well as a leader. Uh, he was a pianist as well as a drummer, accomplished on both of them. Uh, was there at the inception of modern fusion? Remember when we were talking about Tony Williams was kind of that bridge there? Uh, Jack DeJanette was right there around this time. Uh, and he played on with, there was there was double drums on this album, Lenny White. Uh, I believe, some of you audiophiles may, uh, may get me, uh, may correct me on this, but I believe Lenny White was panned to the left of the track as, and then um, uh, Jack DeJanette was panned to the right of the track on the uh, album Bitches Brew by Miles Davis. His style allowed room for hard bop, R&B, avant-garde, and just about any anything else that was coming around. Uh, and Bitches Brew was really just, you know, it was one of the the inceptions the beginning of that whole fusion style so uh you know if that's not your taste but later fusion is that's really like the child that's where kind of that came from i've got a list here he's played with john coltrane miles davis ornette coleman sonny rollins thelonious monk bill evans stan getz keith jarrett chet baker george benson stanley turrentine Her herbie hancock dave holland joe henderson freddie Hubbard, betty carter I mean, on and on and on. He's a Grammy winner, awarded an honorary doctorate from Berkeley, and inducted into the PAS, Percussive Arts Society's Hall of Fame. That's why Jack is on this list. Some great albums. One I already mentioned is Bitches Brew, although for some, uh, I know my first listen, that one was hard. I spent, you know, like 25 or 30 bucks on the CD at the time, and it was really hard for me to ingest where I was musically. So if that one's a little hard for some of you, another great album uh, is Pat Metheny's double album, 8081. That's the deal with these guys at this time. They were pushing the envelope, and some of it may hit you where you want it, some of it may not, and that's okay. Go find another recording by them that you like. Number 17, some of you may not know him, Paul Motion. Now, he played a huge role in freeing drummers of just being a timekeeper. You remember whenever the bebop was starting to come around, you had players like Roy Haynes and everything kind of breaking that mold of the drummer just being a timekeeper. Well, now you have Paul Motion coming along, and he's really re under you know his hands, the regular you know chang chang a lang uh, that they would play behind jazz became as much implied as it was played. His work with the Bill Evans band really helped to bring the rhythm section to the forefront and not as just accompanist to whatever soloist might be up there. He was very subtle in his style, uh, was very well known for the colors that he uh, put in there, as well known for what he didn't say as what he did say, and he tended towards that challenging uh, post-bop style of drumming. Now, two great albums to listen to. They were recorded in the same day uh, at the Village Vanguard in 1962 with the Bill Evans trio. Get this, two crazy great albums recorded in the same set. That's insane. Bill Evans trio, and that's gonna be Sunday at the Village Vanguard and then Waltz for Debbie. Again, it's Paul Motion.
next drummer comes in at number 18. Obviously, remember, we're not doing these in list from greatest to least or least to greatest. We're just doing them in somewhat of a chronological order. You have Mr. Billy Higgins. He played on over 700 recordings. Uh, not only that, three of the biggest jazz crossover hits of the 60s. You had Watermelon Man, uh, The Sidewinder, and uh, Freedom Jazz Dance. Uh, he was also one of the house drummers for Blue Note Records, which is one of the reasons why he played on so many of uh, albums. Billy played mainly free jazz, post-bop, and hard bop. Uh, and then he recorded with players like Herbie Hancock, Pat Metheny, Thelonious Monk, Sonny Rollins, and a slew of others. A great album to listen to him on is Herbie Hancock's Taken Off. This next one, one of my personal favorites in the in the last years. Whenever I discovered him with Joshua Redman, he just floored me. Uh, and then I, I dove into his other stuff, whether that be him working with Nora Jones or him working with uh, whoever it may be. He's just always fantastic. And that is Mr. Brian Blade at number 19. Now, Brian is a, a native of Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, he studied under local legends down there in New Orleans, uh, Ellis Marsalis, who was a very famous jazz pianist uh, and band leader, uh, Mr. Johnny Vidakovich, who is a local legend there, and then Herlin Riley. Johnny Vidakovich is one of those teachers like a uh, Alan Dawson, who you have players like Brian Blade, you have players like Stanton Moore coming out of his uh, lessons. And so anytime you have a teacher like that, you have to stop and pay attention, even if they're not your cup of tea, what are they doing that is so right that's creating these type of players? Johnny Vodakovich is one of those. So Brian Blade came out of that school. Brian Blade is an extremely textural player, player bringing uh, a lot of sparseness when needed. He, he's just as uh, known to not play as he is to play or a very, a very much an intensity when needed. Uh, his list of recording credits, it's a who's who of the music industry. We've got Joshua Redman, which is where I first discovered him, Kenny Garrett, Bob Dylan, Emmy Lou Harris, Joni Mitchell, and so many more. So he's really branched outside of just jazz. In addition, he runs his own project, uh, The Fellowship Band. And then we have albums. The first one that I discovered him on was the uh, Joshua Redman's Elastic album. And then another good one, if you want to hear him as a band leader, you've got his album, Brian Blade Fellowship. <laughs> And number 20, the one you've all been waiting for, none other than Antonio Sanchez himself. Four-time Grammy winner and one of the most sought-after jazz drummers in the international community. He's recorded with the likes of Pat Metheny, Chick Corea, Paquito Di Rivera, Michael Brecker. Uh, he's a talented composer, band leader, sideman. Uh, as well, uh, many of you know for the movie Birdman, he was picked to compose the soundtrack. And that soundtrack consists mainly of his drumming. So he composed around that movie uh, and won a ton of awards for that. I just saw Antonio in clinic not too long ago at the Percussive Arts Society's convention. Uh, and as true to form, he was very, very much concerned with playing the song, complain, uh, playing uh, with themes and playing with variations of those themes so that the listener has something to latch on to. It's something he's very, very well known for. A great album for you to listen to that he's on that really I first discovered his playing and really set with for many, many hours driving in a car was Pat Metheny's uh, The Way Up. And there you have it, my list of the 20 greatest jazz drummers of all time. But it doesn't matter what I think, what do you think? Put it down in the comment section. Did I get some right? Did I get some wrong? What is your top 20 greatest jazz drummers of all time. Hopefully you've learned something. This is a new series, so I'll try to be posting these below in a pinned comment and the description as they come live on YouTube. This is the first uh, in this series. So leave me a comment, let me know what you thought. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel, click that notifications bell so that you get notifications when new videos go up. If it's helped you, click that thumbs up button, share it with somebody that you think it may help. And if you need some help with your drumming, jump over to the website, We've got the Drum Better Daily program there. I would love to have you as a member, but whatever you do, I'll see you here in the next video.